This sleek new airliner, one of the first ever to be propelled by jets, was the Soviet Union's pride in the 1950s. It flies faster and further than anything else and is a showcase of Soviet technology. But there was something fundamentally wrong with this plane. Over the past few months, aircraft similar to this one have been involved in a number of highly bizarre incidents. These planes weren't simply crashing, they were also being thrown into the air, sometimes thousands of feet in the air, leaving investigators scrambling for answers. Hello and welcome back to our channel. Today, we are bringing you the first ever Soviet-built jet airliner. This is the story of the Tupolev Tu-104 passenger aircraft, the most dangerous Soviet airplane. Due to improvements in safety, speed, and comfort, commercial air travel began to grow in the 1950s. Those who could afford it could zip between continents in a matter of hours or fly halfway around the globe in a day. In the 1950s, air travel truly flourished, at least in the Western Hemisphere. The Soviet Union had a very different approach to aviation. There was a generational gap between Western airlines and their Soviet counterparts. They couldn't go very far in the air, were smaller and slower, and provided nothing in the way of comfort. That was a major issue in the vast Soviet Union. To get from Moscow to Vladivostok, for instance, you'd have to make at least six pit stops to refuel the plane. Taking a cramped, noisy plane that couldn't fly high enough to dodge the bad weather on a journey that could take up to 50 hours was a miserable experience in and of itself. The Soviet Union desperately needed a new, modern airliner in the 1950s. Instead of attempting to catch up with the West, they were ready to take a huge risk on a whole new technology. The British startled the world by introducing the first jet-powered airliner in 1952. The de Havilland Comet flew nearly twice as fast and 15,000 feet higher than any aeroplane before it. It had taken years of research and development to create such an aircraft, and while jet engines were still relatively new and unproven, many people could see their promise and the fact that they were the next evolution in air travel. Among them was Andrei Tupolev, a famous Soviet aircraft designer who saw them as a chance to move Soviet air travel into the future. Shortening travel times by a third and opening up air travel to the masses, the Comet is a jet aircraft that could revolutionize the industry. The only difficulty was that Soviet commanders thought these planes were too expensive, wasteful of fuel, and extravagant to justify. The Comet had also been under development for over a decade and cost millions of dollars. These were investments that Soviet officials had hoped to avoid. In spite of this, Tupolev developed a strategy. He assured top Soviet officials that he could construct a jet in three years. He proposed a cheap, efficient jet aeroplane with a larger seating capacity than the Comet. Tupolev was also aware that a jet airliner constructed in the Soviet Union would show the world that the USSR was technologically competitive with the West. A deal like this was too good to pass up. But how is it possible to construct a cutting-edge passenger airliner like the Comet in just under three years? To begin, you take a tremendous shortcut. The Tu-16 bomber was designed specifically to cause devastation in Europe. This served as the blueprint for Tupolev's new passenger jet. He had just finished designing it for the Soviet Air Force, so he thought he was already halfway there. He just needed to make the fuselage wider, but he could keep the engines, even though they weren't the most efficient and were a little loud. Tupolev also thought that he could reuse the wings, which would save engineering time, even though they were better for fast bombing runs. The tail and vertical stabilizer could be used extensively. Landing gear, electronics, and other parts from the bomber's assembly line could also be used. All of these heavy-duty military parts would cost almost 100,000 rubles, which would make for a strong airliner. This new jet was created for far less cost and developed in record time. Tupolev's proposed new airliner would be known as the Tu-104. But as Tupolev was finishing his new plane, it became clear that the switch to jet travel wouldn't be so simple. A string of fatal crashes caused by Comet design flaws in 1954 led to the plane's retirement. Commercial flights on the Comet were grounded for four years while investigators figured out the problems. 
When the Soviet Union's first jet airliner took to the skies for the first time in June 1955, it was the only jet airliner in the world that could actually take passengers. This should have served as a warning, but instead, they used it for propaganda. In 1956, a delegation of Soviet leaders traveled to Britain on the new jet while it was still undergoing flight testing. A lot of people were taken aback by the airliner's rakish appearance. Still reeling from the comet's grounding, aviation experts and British news reporters were whipped into a frenzy. The media was under the impression that the Soviets had taken a giant step forward years ahead of the West, with a far more advanced and massively sized design. However, the Soviets saw this as a public relations goldmine, and this wasn't the last time we'd see their shiny new jet. In the months to come, 104s went to cities all over Europe. Each time, crowds of people greeted the plane, and dignitaries got a chance to look at the Soviet technology. In 1957, a 104 showed up at the Paris Air Show. It was the first time that a plane that wasn't made in the West had been there. A few months later, the new airliner flew all the way to the U.S. for another state visit. This was the first time a jet airliner crossed the Atlantic Ocean. The 104 was a huge propaganda win for the Soviets, and making it quickly out of a bomber seemed like a stroke of genius. However, the first signals of disaster were already appearing. In comparison to other aircraft, the Tu-104 proved difficult to pilot. Pilots frequently complained about the aircraft's heavy, unresponsive controls, as well as its massive weight and sharply spread wings, which made flying at low speeds extremely difficult. Landing at crowded civilian airports was still another challenge. Because pilots feared stalling, it was usual practice to land the aircraft at a higher speed than intended. The plane had no brakes, no thrust reversers, and no wheel brakes, so stopping was a problem. Frequently, a quickly deployed parachute was the only thing that prevented the airliner from going beyond the runway. Soviet authorities had previously ignored such concerns, but by 1958, the airliner's strange behavior had become undeniable. In February, a CSA-104 encountered turbulence and lost both engines. The plane lost 20,000 feet of altitude before the anxious pilots could restart the engines after losing power. A month later, the 104 once again strayed into stormy territory, but this time the jet was propelled upwards to an altitude of 44,000 feet, much higher than the plane was designed to go. Finally, the plane stalled and started falling to earth before the pilots could restore control. Despite these near catastrophes, Soviet officials were quick to place the blame on the pilots. However, these incidents continued. In August, another 104 were launched into the air inexplicably. The plane stalled again, and this time the pilots were unable to recover. Unfortunately, no one survived. Two months later, another 104 was launched into the air while en route from Beijing to Moscow. This time, the pilot bravely reported events as they were unfolding by radio. However, the data he provided would end up being crucial, even though he couldn't save the plane. Authorities could no longer overlook the strange string of incidents. Something was obviously wrong with the aircraft. However, they did not ground the aircraft and instead allowed it to continue flying passengers while they investigated the mystery. Investigators would eventually determine that the cause was strong updrafts that the pilots were unable to counteract. In addition, the plane's bomber heritage likely played a role. Because of the 104's bigger pressurized cabin, the aircraft's center of gravity could be affected by the weight carried. Because of this, the 104 had a built-in tendency to tip upward in an updraft, and the pilots had no way of preventing this. The aircraft had to undergo a lot of emergency changes, and it was restricted from flying above a particular altitude. But not before a second incident in 1959, when a different 104 encountered an updraft and the pilots were unable to recover. This serious design flaw resulted in the deaths of 144 people. Despite modifications, the aircraft continued to have numerous mishaps, the most frequent of which were runway overshoots due to the challenging nature of flying the airliner developed from a heavy bomber. Almost one out of every five Tu-104s manufactured would be destroyed in an accident. However, because of the Soviet Union's secrecy, these occurrences did not receive the attention they deserved. Despite this, 
the airliner earned a terrible reputation among travelers. The Soviets, like the British, paid a high price to be the first to fly by jet. But by 1958, the Comet had been redesigned a lot and was back in service. The United States also had its own jet airliner. The 104 no longer had any propaganda value. Even so, the Soviet Union's first jetliner was a very important part of making air travel in the country more modern. To make room for the jet, air traffic control systems were updated, new terminals were built, and runways were lengthened all over the Soviet Union. The 104 gained a place among the world's pioneering aircraft thanks to the operational lessons it could teach future Soviet carriers. Do you believe that the Soviets should have grounded the 104 sooner? Or do you think the way things played out actually helped future developments of jet aircraft? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. And if you enjoy this type of content, make sure to like, subscribe to our channel, and click the bell icon so that you're notified every time we post something new. Thank you for watching, and we will see you again in our next video.